This first picture has nothing at all to do with foreign policy. Did you, did you guess that? But it, it illustrates the number two reason that I'm happy to be visiting Colorado for the first time in about 20 years. This picture was taken in Victor, Colorado, close to Cripple Creek in 1910. And these gentlemen had just completed the task of drilling a drainage tunnel uh, that enabled the gold mines of Cripple Creek to keep producing for another 10 years uh, by doing the drainage. And the gentleman here in the dark coat is my great-grandfather, Theophilus Countryman, uh, who was the engineer who got the two teams to dig through granite a mile and a half in each direction, and they met with an error of one inch when they got to the middle. So. I, I've got in my family four generations of scientists and engineers, and I'm the disreputable one who went into public service instead. But, uh, but I'm proud of being back in Colorado, and I'm really thrilled to have relatives here now. Uh, that's the number two reason. The number one reason is because I am thrilled to see so many people interested in foreign affairs. It's very easy for guys like me to stay in Washington and talk in the same circle in Washington to people who think largely the same and in the same uh, paradigms that we've thought about for a long time. But foreign policy only changes, only evolves, and only serves the interests of American citizens when American citizens demonstrate an interest and with their voices and with their votes get the world, get the uh, government in Washington, both the permanent government, of which in a sense I was a part, the term deep state, if you want to discuss that, <laughs> is a bunch of malarkey, uh, but both the permanent government and elected officials to respond. What I was asked to talk about today was about US foreign policy at the midpoint of the Trump administration. And it is exceedingly difficult to define, even though the Trump White House, like other White Houses before, has issued a national security strategy, has issued a national military strategy, has issued a nuclear uh, policy review, which is my particular field. Uh, and reading those, you would find an awful lot of similarities to the same documents issued by previous administrations. What I'll try to do today is to bring the same skills that I think I developed working in American embassies overseas, in Yugoslavia, in Egypt, in Greece, in Italy, to trying to analyze the foreign policy of the Trump administration. And as I said, it's not going to be easy to define. It's going to be certainly easier to critique than to define. So it will be a little bit uh, of both, and I thank you for your patience. I'm going to go pretty fast through a lot of topics. Uh, first, trying to define overall trends, and then in the second part of what I'll talk about is to talk about my particular field of specialty for the last eight years, which is nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, uh, and associated security issues. So let's, next slide, please, Bill. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> the president has made a point of saying America first. And in a sense, that's not different from every other president. Every other president seeks to hold at the top the interests of the United States in foreign policy, in both security and economic policy. Uh, so it is not in itself a new description. But I think that previous presidents have realized that defining America's interests solely in terms of immediate reward and in terms of zero-sum outcomes, in fact, leads to a situation where the United States is not behaving any differently from autocratic societies around the world or from the empires of the past. And it leads to a situation where the countries that joined us as allies 
are less willing to be our allies. Not because they don't get security and economic benefits, but because we are retreating from the values that we once shared. Next slide. The, uh, this is uh, not my definition. This is a colleague, Ryan Schaefer, who writes on a blog called Just Security that I recommend. Uh, and it is an attempt to define how President Trump has articulated our foreign policy in terms of negatives, and very importantly, in negating some of the things that were basic to our foreign policy approach in the past. First, to view the world and all of the world as an unrelenting threat towards America and towards American security. Second, to deny that the United States has any benefit from or any reason to assert a moral leadership in the world, to assert that we have a higher purpose as one of the world's very first democracies. Third and most troubling to me, a predilection towards associating ourselves with authoritarian governments around the world and denigrating the more open, more raucous, more difficult to deal with democracies that have been our traditional allies. Uh, and finally, and this is what is perhaps most painful as a uh, longtime diplomat with 35 years uh, in the State Department, is to assert that the most important tools that we have are tough words, hard bargaining, short-term transactions, a focus on mercantilism, that is a trade surplus as a goal worthy in itself. Uh, these are the things that concern me uh, about this definition. <clears throat> what I'd like to pose instead in the next slide is uh, the Bill, the uh, Jim, I'm sorry, I keep calling you Bill, I know it's Jim. The, uh, a lot of authors have termed the American century, called the 20th century the American century, or some have called the period since the end of the wor Second World War the American century. And the reason they did it is because the United States established leadership in the crucial areas that promoted peace and stability and prosperity around the world. And that is the institutional governance not international governments, but institutional governments that allowed for predictable relations between states in establishing security arrangements with countries that relied upon the word of the United States in providing defense and security, in establishing the ground rules that led to the boom in world trade, economic prosperity, in the kind of development that has seen the share of the world's population who live in absolute poverty declined drastically in just the last 20 years. And in sharing a concern for issues that affect the entire world equally, uh, such as environment, such as fighting terrorism. So again, just to remind you of what these institutions are. Uh, Jim, next slide. Uh, at the Biggest level, of course, the United States was the driving force behind creation of the United Nations. The European Union was not our idea, and yet the US has been constantly supportive of an institution that has prevented war in Western Europe for more than 70 years, something that was not possible in the previous 1,000 years. The International Court of Justice. Next slide, please. The economic institutions matter no less. The IMF and the World Bank have provided monetary stability while, by the way, and not coincidentally, reasserting and uh, making concrete the economic primacy of the United States and of the United States dollar. The US has not been as generous per capita as other countries in contributing to international development, but still, AID is the biggest one out there in terms of developing other countries, reducing poverty, increasing health, and in that sense, promoting American security. And then trade 
arrangements. The World Trade Organization is in the president's targets right now, uh, but in fact, it's an organization that has decided in favor of the United States many more times than it has decided against the United States on a trade dispute. The next slide. And of course, the United States has been a leader in security, not just in attracting allies, not just in being able to work with allies in Europe and Asia, but in establishing some basic ground rules for how countries go to war and how they avoid war. And these are the essential ones that particularly were in my domain for the last seven years of my career, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Biological Weapons Convention, and the Chemical Weapons Convention. All of this was accomplished because the United States acted in a manner that was different from any other empire in history. My wife, who was born in Europe, and I have this debate more often than is productive, <laughs> as to whether the United States should be considered an empire. And I, I don't think so, but she thinks so. And the main reason I don't think so is because the US did something that no other empire ever did, which is, it said, if we establish all these institutions and all these rules, those rules will be binding on the United States, just as much as they are binding on every other country in the world. No other empire before ever said that. I'll be one of the first to admit that the United States was not always perfectly consistent in honoring the rules that it helped establish. But it made an effort and set an example for honoring those rules in a way that no previous empire could. What are the effects of the United States walking away from those international arrangements, as we've seen in the case of the Paris Agreement, in the denigration of the importance of NATO, uh, in the attacks or the threats to withdraw from the World Trade Organization. Uh, they are, it adds up in my view, to a loss for the United States. I heard uh, last week uh, a really inspiring speech by James Baker, the former Secretary of State under uh, President Bush Sr. And he made the very simple point that the US cannot retreat from the world stage. If the United States pulls back from these arrangements, this would result in greater instability and conflict. It would directly undermine the safety and well-being of Americans. And some of these you can see in very direct effects. Uh, for example, in climate change, I'm concerned that the United States, whose technological base means we should be the world's leader in new technologies that will prevent climate change, we have a president who's willing to give away that leadership to China. Uh, it means we will lose more often in trade arrangements and trade disputes than we win. And more importantly, we'll be incapable of identifying winners and losers in trade disputes. The, those are some of the direct implications of the uh, retreat from these agreements. But let me talk about some of the indirect ones, some of the ones that are harder to define in their immediate effect. The next slide. Uh, you might know some of these gentlemen. Uh, we have consistently had a policy of realism in dealing with every country of the world, but a dealing even with dictators and occasionally working with or even supporting dictators, but always demonstrating a preference for democratic governments. We have walked away from that now in a way that demonstrates a clear preference for autocratic governments as being perhaps more reliable. Uh, next slide, please. And what bothers me about that 
is that we are giving up a moral claim to speak on behalf of democracy and human rights. These are the kind of democracy advocates that I had the chance to work with in Serbia and Tunisia, not actually in China. That's actually in Hong Kong, that picture. The, uh, uh, and we worked uh, with democratic and human rights activists, not just because we were fuzzy headed, but because that's in America's interests. Why do people want to come to the United States legally and illegally? It is because they are unable to join, enjoy the benefits of democracy and human rights in their own country, uh, more than any other reason. So this is the, the first indirect effect of this retreat. And to mention just a few of the others, if the United States cannot be relied upon to keep to an agreement that it has signed, then it is a very good question who the hell wants to sign a new agreement, not only with this president, but with the next president. Why would North Korea believe that any agreement that it signs with this president will be binding for the rest of his term and for the next president as well? The second thing that concerns me is we will soon we will ever less be able to rely on the best US allies to meet major international goals. In my field of work at various points, whether it was in the Balkans or in the Middle East or on issues of nonproliferation, our best partners were the European Union. Yeah, they are hard to work with. It's 28 people trying to speak with one voice. But when they do speak with one voice, they are by far the most important partner that we can have on any global goal. And the same goes for allies such as Japan or South Korea. Uh, I've already mentioned the work of those who are advocating for human rights or for more democratic systems in their countries are already feeling discouraged by what they see as a loss of traditional support from the United States. I'm very worried about very practical effects that hit the United States taxpayer, which is less influence for the United States economy. That is a long-term trend in any case. But when the United States uses its power and the prime role of the dollar in international commerce in support of goals that are not supported by our best allies, it increases the incentive for the rest of the world to move away from the dollar. And that uh, is an inevitable movement that we can either accelerate or we can act to preserve the role of the US dollar as long as possible. Uh, I'm concerned about, and it's, an, it's a whole nother speech I could give you for an hour, about the hollowing out of the Department of State. Uh, and the fact that we have a White House that simply doesn't trust the Department of State professionals. I think there's a concept in the White House that anybody who's smart has gone into real estate or law. Uh, uh, and uh, those who are working in public service, whether the State Department or something else, are simply leeches on society. It's important that the Congress rejected the Trump administration proposal to cut the State Department budget by 40%. But the fact is the level that it's being sustained at is actually a downward trend right now. If you look at the small part, well, first of all, the $60 billion or so budget for State Department and foreign aid uh, is less than 1% of US GDP. It's less than 8% of the Department of Defense budget. And a lot of that is for things including military aid, economic aid, and everything else. The part of the budget that goes for what is called core diplomatic functions is less than $5 billion a year. And in real terms, that is a decline of more than 20% from where it was 10 years ago. We are less able to staff our embassies to do the basic work 
of diplomacy than we were 10 years ago. And finally, one of the indirect consequences, and we could go into some detail, uh, is the fact that our policy making process has become deregularized. That is, it is dependent upon fairly arbitrary decisions, not the regularized, believe me, agonizing and painful interagency consultations that preceded every other major decision. We just don't do that anymore in this administration. So uh, that's big picture, and as I said, it's more of a critique than a definition. But I would like to talk about a few of the specific areas uh, that matter. And by the way, there's one more point I don't have up here, but that really annoys me. Uh, <laughs> And that is, I see a tendency in this administration to end up acting the same way that the Chinese or the Russians do, which is to say only big powers matter. Small nations do not have the same individual rights that big nations do. Uh, and that's, as I said, personally annoying and I think ultimately dangerous. Uh, let's talk about a few specific issues, and uh, let's go to the next slide. I'll just mention one uh, before I march into very specific nuclear issues. The U.S.-Chinese relationship is the most important relationship in international relations for at least the next 20, 50, 100 years. I'm very cautious about saying that in front of our NATO allies or in front of the Japanese because we always used to say that about the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, but the fact is that this is a relationship that I think has best been defined by Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard as one of cooperative rivalry. That's the only way we're going to succeed in managing this relationship in the future, to recognize that we have so many common interests with the Chinese that either of us are capable of disrupting all of our common interests with uh, ill-considered actions, uh, but also that we will inevitably be rivals for economic and technological supremacy or dominance, or at least leadership in the coming century. Um, this is an area in which I think President Trump does have the right instinct in one way, which is to say that China has benefited for too long economically from the economic rules that we created and that we have been honoring. Uh, there is a considerable degree to which the Chinese economy has been built on theft of intellectual property. That's not to dismiss all the other important things in research and development and economic uh, education that the Chinese have done, but theft of intellectual property has been a big part of it. Uh, and it is right for the United States to stand up and find an effective means to deal with that. I'm not convinced the president has found those effective means. I'm not sure he understands that a trade deficit is not an inherently bad thing. Um, but at least he is seeking to address the issue. It's fashionable to say that we are in a new Cold War with the Chinese, and this is very clearly how the Chinese press interpreted a speech by Vice President Pence last month. Uh, but this is not at all like the US-Soviet Cold War. We did not have the degree of positive interpenetration between the US and the Soviet Union that we have with China today. Uh, $500 billion a year in trade between the two countries. Uh, Three million Chinese tourists a year in the United States. Uh, 350,000 Chinese students in the United States. It's not a new Cold War. Uh, 
and it's not on the same terms as we had with the Soviet Union. At the same time, having just passed the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, we had a lot of good historians remind us how strong the trade ties and the personal ties between Germany and Britain were in 1914, and yet they still stumbled into war. I have some confidence that uh, both U.S. leadership, with or despite the president, and the Chinese leadership, and again, with or despite their president, will manage to avoid uh, actually getting the conflict. So let me talk a little bit about nuclear issues. Uh, and although I did a lot of different things in my 35 years in the State Department, the way I choose to spend my volunteer time in retirement is working still on nuclear issues, weapons of mass destruction issues. At the very end, I'll give you one minute on the work I do now with the Arms Control Association. Uh, but let's talk about the, the three nuclear issues that are on the foreign policy table right now. Next slide. The first one doesn't have to be there. It's not a crisis. It is only a crisis because the U.S. administration has made it a crisis. The, Iranian, the Iran agreement with six other countries, not just with the U.S., the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015, did not solve every problem between the United States and Iran. It, in fact, followed the pattern that we follow with every other country that we try to settle one problem at a time. It effectively ended the possibility for Iran to pursue a nuclear weapon. It did that not just with words, but physically. It removed 98% of the uranium that Iran had enriched from the country. It removed two-thirds of the centrifuges that Iran was operating. And it established the most intrusive international inspection agreement that the world has ever seen. The president pulled out of this agreement in part because it was a campaign promise. And that does mean something, whatever you think of uh, the degree to which candidates keep promises. In part because it was a signal achievement of President Obama and I think that our current president has an obsession about his predecessor. Uh, and in part because of the strong influence of a couple of governments that knew how to push his buttons. I mean, the Chinese, the Saudis, the Israelis have learned better than anyone else how to appeal to the president's ego. And the Saudis and the Israelis have used that in order to push a decision that all of the president's professional advisors opposed up until he was ready to make the decision. The, what we are in now, I'm not worried about Iran getting to a nuclear weapon. I think Iran is in deep trouble because of US sanctions. But I think for the next two years at least, they are not going to go back onto the path of pursuing a nuclear weapon. That's not the threat at the moment. Rather, the US declaration of all out economic warfare on the Islamic Republic is one that I don't think will succeed in Secretary Pompeo's stated goals. Recall he said, here are 12 things you've got to change essentially all of your foreign policy and half of your domestic policy, and then we can talk. It's not a diplomatic approach. It is a declaration of economic warfare. And what really worries me about it is the potential for the United States to stumble, uh, or perhaps not quite stumble, but jump into a military conflict with Iran that will be far worse than the disastrous invasion of Iraq. And that could come about either because the president is inexperienced and impulsive. It could come about because his two key advisors, Secretary Pompeo and National Security Advisor Bolton, have stated repeatedly in the past, before they were in their current positions, their desire to go to war with Iran. 
It could come about because our important friends in the region, Israel and Saudi Arabia, see the option of using the U.S. military to redress what they see as an imbalance of power in the region. Uh, and it could certainly come about if the Iranians do something stupid. And there's the next slide just to illustrate that. The Iranians, believe me, are no less unified than the United States government. Uh, <laughs> they are just as capable of doing something stupid. And something stupid can be something small. That's, uh, it's actually an old picture from the 1980s, but you can see similar sights today of little Iranian Revolutionary Guard speedboats hanging around tankers and sometimes around US warships. And it's not difficult to imagine a situation where a minor incident becomes an all-out military conflict. So that's what I worry about with the president's approach to Iran. Uh, next slide. North Korea is different. Uh, North Korea is more dangerous than Iran. It has nuclear weapons. It has ballistic missiles of probable intercontinental range. We do not know, at least uh, I have not read any intelligence information in nearly two years, but I think it's still true that we have no way of knowing whether the North Koreans could accurately deliver a nuclear warhead on the United States. But it would be kind of foolish to assume they do not have that capability, uh, given the other capabilities that they've demonstrated. Um, it is a genuine threat to the United States, more so than Iran, and a threat to US allies in the region. Uh, it is less predictable than Iran in terms of its potential behavior. And it represents the first new threat that could reach the United States homeland in the last 30 years. That's significant. The president is not correct when he says that we never got anywhere in our diplomatic approach to North Korea. We did succeed twice for a substantial period, for a period of years, in putting a break on North Korea's nuclear weapons development. But he is correct when he says that our diploma diplomacy as usual did not succeed in getting a final answer to the problem. And I don't criticize him for trying a different approach at the highest level. Um, there is an important opportunity here to change the uh, long-standing dynamic on the Korean Peninsula in a way that can benefit all the actors in the region, including the United States. I'm not terribly impressed with the way that the White House and the State Department are approaching it right now, but I'm not prepared to say that they are on the right track. The hard part, and it is a very hard part for any political leader or secretary of state to talk about, is the very real prospect that we cannot fully succeed. The complete denuclearization of North Korea is an astoundingly huge undertaking. Uh, it, is not, it is something that hasn't been tried in any country before. And there is no indication yet that the North Koreans are close to an agreement that would permanently give up all their nuclear weapons. But there is the potential in a step-by-step -step process for the two sides to get to a better understanding of a peace agreement, what a peace regime would look like, and to get some very tight limits on a North Korean nuclear arsenal that would effectively reduce, almost eliminate the threat that it poses to the United States and its allies. So while it's hard to be optimistic and it's hard to say that the president accomplished a lot in Singapore, I'm not prepared to criticize him for the instinct that he's shown in this direction. So let's talk about what is still the most dangerous relationship in the world and that is between the United States and Russia. 
And just to remind you what it's all about, the next slide, I recommend this website. It's called outrider.org. It has some really fascinating information in, in a very absorbable way about both nuclear weapons and climate change. What you see here is a 300 mega, uh, kiloton weapon exploded above Denver. Uh, and the number of fatalities, 111,000. Number of injuries, 161,000. The outer limit, the white is essentially complete annihilation, atomization, and the red part is kind of how far fires would immediately spread. That's one 300 kiloton weapon. That's kind of the standard size in both the US and the Russian arsenal. It's about 20 times the size of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. It's less than 1% the size of the largest nuclear weapon ever tested by the Soviet Union back in the 1960s. It is a little bit bigger than the most successful North Korean test that has occurred so far. Uh, the United States and Russia have about one and a half thousand weapons of this size pointed at each other. That's the current limit. Uh, we have a few small, uh, quite a few smaller, we have a few bigger, but that's kind of your standard size of nuclear weapon. And I think it's important to point out again because in as memory fades of the complete destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I've had the opportunity to visit both cities, Nagasaki, just three months ago. Uh, I think there is a tendency of some people to think that nuclear war is just a little bit bigger than other kinds of war. Uh, in fact, nuclear war, if you can do that with a single bomb, uh, the fact is that with 1,550 bombs of that size each, the United States and the Russian Federation could literally end human civilization. Uh, all right, if I've got your attention, we'll go to the next slide, because it's, <laughs> it's not all bad news. <laughs> this is uh, the US nuclear weapons stockpile from 1962 to 2017. Uh, there's a more dramatic slide that shows the buildup through the 60s to a real parabolic curve up to uh, our peak in about 1969 when the US had more than 30,000 nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union reached its peak at nearly 40,000 nuclear weapons in the late 1970s. And the good news is that uh, a couple of important things happened at the same time. One is a lot of generals, beginning in the United States, but eventually in the Soviet Union as well, realized that this was madness. That having 40,000 weapons, including pretty small ones that you could use, you know, a, a nuke for every occasion, that you could use in a particular wartime situation, that it inevitably led to a massive exchange of nuclear forces, and that there was no <coughs> capability of doing what is called nuclear war fighting, that you could somehow contain it at a certain level. Our generals realized that, Soviet generals realized that, but more importantly, every president since Eisenhower up to Obama realized that US security is enhanced by arms control measures. U.S. security cannot be measured by an advantage of megatons over the opponent. It is best measured by whether we have done everything we can to minimize the possibility that these weapons will ever be used against us. And the best way to do that is to constrain the adversary's forces. So from 1972 forward, a series of agreements, and I think maybe that, that's the next slide if you want to go, Jim, uh, have led the US and the Soviet Union, later the Russian Federation, to reduce the threat that we pose to each other, to, po to place absolutely symmetrical and reciprocal 
caps on each other's uh, nuclear capabilities, uh, and to have incredibly intrusive verification and inspection method, measures. You remember Ronald Reagan, well, not you young people, but <laughs> the, you remember Ronald Reagan, and I happened to be in uh, the Rose Garden that day as a very junior officer, as President Reagan uh, said, veri no provieri, trust but verify. Uh, we have done so much verification between our two countries for all these years. We are in a more difficult situation today. The current threat is to what could be described as the real turning point in arms control, and that's the 1987 Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, again, some of you as old as me might remember a debate in Europe in the early to mid-1980s about the stationing of short-range, intermediate-range U.S. nuclear missiles in Western Europe. Uh, in response to Russian deployment of such missiles close to their border with NATO. Uh, and the result of that tension was the historic agreement between Reagan and Gorbachev in 1987 that for the first time in history eliminated an entire category of weapons, intermediate range nuclear weapons from the two countries' arsenal. Uh, and it became the foundation uh, for the next 10 years of relatively good relations between Russia and the U.S. and NATO. Now, what's happened in the last few years is that the Russian Federation has built and deployed a new intermediate-range missile. Uh, it is a cruise missile that is not a different different from a ballistic missile, but it has a range specifically prohibited by the INF Treaty, a range between 500 kilometers and 5,500 kilometers. Uh, and we know that they have this weapon and they built it. They deny it, but we know it. We have raised this issue with them for more than four years, trying to get clarification and trying to force them to demonstrate that they are in compliance with the treaty without success. The president last month at a campaign rally announced that the United States will withdraw from this treaty. What should bother you about this is several things. No consultation with the Congress, which by the way, the U.S. Senate ratified that treaty back in 1987. No consultation with key allies. No interagency discussion. And literally, there was a meeting scheduled at the deputy secretary level among defense, state, and other agencies. Mr. Bolton canceled it and simply told the president, why don't you announce we're leaving this treaty? And what really ought to bother those of us concerned about U.S. security and European security is it gives, it does absolutely nothing to counter the tiny military advantage that Russia has gained with deployment of these missiles. Rather, it frees Russia to deploy as many of them as they want while saying it's the United States that pulled out of the seminal arms control agreement. It's both a security victory and a military victory, uh, and a public relations victory for Mr. Putin. Uh, it's not quite dead yet. The U.S. has not formally notified withdrawal from the treaty, and it can only take effect six months after such notification. Uh, a lot of us are working to see if NATO allies can put some pressure on both Moscow, especially Moscow, but at Washington as well, to avoid a precipitous withdrawal from the treaty. Um, but it also, I'm a little pessimistic we can save the INF Treaty, and it leads me to concern for the next treaty and the next slide. Uh, 
a, a potentially even more important treaty is uh, the New START Treaty signed by President Obama and President Medvedev in 2010. This is the treaty that, as I mentioned, uh, required both Russia and the United States to limit the deployed strategic warheads to 1,550. Uh, it uh, has enabled us uh, to continue a trend uh, that has been going on for 10 years, that the United States had so many nuclear weapons that we have been deconstructing nuclear weapons faster than one every day for the last 10 years. And in case you were wondering, yes, it costs more to take apart a nuclear weapon than it did to put it together. Um, the, uh, the New START Treaty was ratified by the Senate in 2010. It expires in February of 2021. In this treaty, the US and Russia did something unusual for a treaty, which is to say it's got a 10-year term, but if the two presidents agree, it can be extended another five years. And the thought was, we've just done this very good treaty. We need to keep working on further arms reductions. We should try to do that in 10 years, but maybe it will take 15 years to do the next treaty. Um, well, it turns out to take a lot longer than that, not least because of Russia's aggressive actions in Georgia and Ukraine, especially since 2010. But the problem now is that the two presidents have the capability with a simple two signatures to extend this treaty from 2021 out to 2026 and give negotiators some time to come up with new methods of reducing the threat that we pose to each other. Um, I'm very concerned that the president doesn't understand this and sees it only as an Obama treaty. Uh, I'm very even more concerned that Mr. Bolton, who has, n has never liked this treaty, will find a way to sabotage it, to not only prevent its extension, but to make it so that even if there is a new president at the beginning of 2021, that person would not be able to extend the treaty. So this is of great concern, and it should be of great concern to you for two reasons. First, it would be the first time since 1972 that there has been no numerical limit on the two sides' nuclear arsenals at all. And that raises the specter of a new nuclear arms race. I'm deeply concerned by some of the rhetoric that these two presidents have used that sounds to me North Korean rather than American or Russian, and that is defining the nation's glory in terms of our nuclear weapons and boasting about our strength. Presidents of the US and Russia and China and France and Britain got off of that habit 40 years ago. And it has come back in vogue under uh, the current presidents in Washington and Moscow. The second reason you ought to be concerned is the verification measures, the notifications, the inspections we do with each other, we can't match those. Even <clears throat> with the very best intelligence means we have, the US intelligence community cannot keep count of Russian warheads with the same accuracy as we do through these very detailed transparency measures that we have. All right, um, this is, uh, sorry, if you go to the next slide, it's just to remind you yeah, there's a lot of countries with a few nuclear warheads. The U.S. and Russia still have more than 90% of the, U of the nuclear warheads in the world. None of those other countries by themselves could literally destroy the planet and make it uninhabitable for humans. But the U.S. and the Russian, either one alone and certainly together, they could do so. Um, it is important to note the brown at the top are warheads that are retired and that ultimately are going to be destroyed. And so 
On the one hand, I'm proud of that progress from 30 and 40,000 down to 4,000 some. Uh, but it kind of leads to the next point, next slide, which is how many do we actually need? And this is one where it becomes of interest to US citizens pretty fast. And in fact, uh, given developments of the last month, you may need to weigh in on this soon. When President Obama convinced the US Senate to ratify the New START Treaty in 2010, he agreed that he would support a modernization of all three legs of the triad, all of the different delivery systems we have for nuclear weapons, ground-based, sea-based, air-based. Uh, that is a program, and there's some of the details, that will add up over 30 years to at least $1.2 trillion dollars and more likely in inflation-adjusted terms, $1.7 trillion. I don't know how many of you know what a trillion is. I, I can't picture it myself, but it, it looks pretty cool on graphs. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, on top of that, President Trump has proposed a couple of new nuclear weapons not even included in the overall modernization program. Uh, and it's going to lead to an interesting debate, next slide, that we haven't had for a while, which questions one of the eternal truths of the nuclear priesthood, which is the triad. ICBMs, we have 400 Minuteman threes based in North Dakota, Montana, some in Wyoming, I think. Uh, that uh, each of those have a 300 kiloton warhead like the one that destroyed Denver a few minutes ago. Um, there's a real question as to whether we need these in the future. And I know there's a lot of folks just down the road who are going to accuse me of heresy. Uh, but the fact is that such figures as Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, and one of the secretaries of defense who understood nuclear weapons better than anyone else says these are now more dangerous than they are secure. When you watch a TV show or a movie and the president has seven minutes to decide whether to launch a retaliatory strike against Russia, not knowing whether it's a false alarm or not, and by the way, that's an actual scenario that has occurred a few times, the reason he's only got seven minutes is if he doesn't act sooner, those 400 missiles will be destroyed by the first sortie of Russian missiles. It is classic, use them or lose them. Without those 400 missiles, argues former Secretary Perry, you have a situation in which the president can wait to see if this is a genuine attack or not and still retain the power to atomize Moscow and St. Petersburg with the weapons aboard our nuclear submarines. Uh, in that sense, these become a liability. And so we're going to see in the Congress, I think, over the next year, uh, the first real debate about the uh, sustaining this article of faith, this idea that we need all three legs of this nuclear triad. There's a couple of reasons it's going to be an interesting debate. Next slide is, uh, I mentioned the national debt. I can't picture a trillion. I can't picture 22 trillion. Uh, I know it will be two trillion more than that before the end of this president's administration. I have no doubt that the United States could afford to run the biggest arms race in the world and win it. We could afford to do that. But I also know we have a political system that forces us not to afford what we do, what we choose. Instead, we run up a debt that is, by any means of looking at it, a national security problem in itself. So the next slide. Because I can't picture 22 million, it's easier to just show a suitcase of money and tell you that every one of you 
every one of your children and grandchildren, every man, woman, and child in the United States currently owes $60,000. That is your share of the national debt, and it will be 80,000 about three years from now. Uh, and it is, uh, I mean, the older you are, the more tempting to say it's not my problem. Uh, <laughs> But the fact is, someday we have to pay that back. And there will be, I think, in a way that there has not been a debate in the last few years, real concern about the cost of sustaining that nuclear development plan, including the cost of what does it distract, what does it take away from other pressing defense capabilities that the United States needs to have. And the next slide, the other reason it's going to be Fascinating is these two gentlemen you may not recognize. Jim Inhofe is the, going to be the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Adam Smith of Seattle is going to be the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and has already put out notice that he's going to look really hard at all of the issues I've raised and others. Mr. Inhofe is a uh, big fan. Uh, not, I don't mean to say that in a negative way. I mean, he's a strong supporter of everything nuclear that uh, has ever been proposed. So how this uh, works out in the Congress when they get to conference committee uh, is going to be a far more interesting debate than we've had in the last few decades uh, about nuclear policy in the Congress. Next slide. Um, and this is just... Uh, a reminder of things I didn't talk about. Uh, I think India and Pakistan are more likely to have a nuclear war than the US and Russia. I don't think they can destroy the world in the same way that the US and Russia can. The fact is we've learned a lot over the years about how to minimize risk. Uh, other countries that are new to nuclear weapons are, as my colleague Scott Sagan points out, likely either to repeat our old mistakes or make new ones and not get away with them with the degree of luck that we have had for nearly 70 years. Very last slide, and then I promise I'll stop. Uh, we've tried in many different ways to get the message through everybody we know who might talk to our president, and for that matter, to President Putin, because I engage several times a year in what we call track two dialogues with old, old farts like me, that is, formerly important Russian diplomats and generals, uh, trying to talk about how we can get to it. And we all agree this is the most basic thing. If we could see Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin repeat what Reagan and Gorbachev said more than 30 years ago, we'd be getting somewhere. Okay, that was, as I predicted, longer than I predicted. Um, <laughs> So, uh, let's do some questions or comments, and I'm happy. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking over concern about all this. I can relax. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no sense in all this worrying about it. The other question is, have you ever multiplied out three megatons by 3,000 missiles? And uh, and you talk about trillions of pounds. I mean, it's like rearranging the deck, the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. I mean, if somebody lets go of those, yep. of course, white privilege will take its, take its way out because it will be Europe, the United States, and Russia. But I'm just saying that that amount of poundage is just seems yeah. very high. Yeah. Um. I, I should have brought more slides that would show all the different ways you could measure what a kiloton is. Uh, we made some news last year in Afghanistan when we dropped the biggest conventional weapon that the, I don't know, the military like to call the mother of all bombs. Uh, it is, uh, I can't remember if it's two or three percent as big as these nuclear weapons that we're talking about. Uh, there's just no comparison. The other chart that somebody showed me last week that I should have plagiar I should have borrowed uh, <laughs> was uh, uh, it showed the target set for Moscow 
under different scenarios and how many different nuclear weapons were targeted just on Moscow in not the current, but a previous US targeting regime. Uh, and it, it literally is, it makes the rubble bounce. Um, I say civilization ending because of the work that's been done by a lot of people who simply point out that the amount of debris that's thrown up into the atmosphere from a few hundred nuclear explosions uh, would produce a nuclear winter. Now, you can argue about that less, you can have a, a, a uh, more two-sided argument about that than you can about climate change. Uh, but it is a fact that the combination of radiation and just pollution of the atmosphere from a few hundred nuclear weapons uh, is potentially civilization ending. Now, but your first comment reminds me. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to worry about these things, but I, so you don't have to, but um, I also, when I retired last year, I promised my wife I would never have another full-time job. So I'm sticking to that. And the, the volunteer I work, work that I do about half-time is for an organization called the Arms Control Association. And uh, I'm not speaking for them tonight, I'm speaking for myself, but let me just describe the organization. The Arms Control Association is the oldest non-governmental organization in the field, founded in 1971. And despite being the oldest, we're also just about the smallest. Uh, very lean, mean machine that focuses not on big academic articles, uh, not on giant conferences, but on monthly type policy prescriptions. This is what happened. This is what it means. This is what the United Nations or the White House or the State Department or the Russians or the Europeans should do. Uh, and uh, I love being supportive of the incredibly professional work that they do. So I urge you to learn a little more about it at armscontrol.org. I brought just a few copies of our magazines and a few little brochures. Uh, it's, it's probably the cheapest NGO that you'll ever join, because we just asked $25 to get our magazine. Uh, but if you have 25000 instead, come see me afterwards. So. <laughs> yes? At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that the use of tariffs by the Trump administration might not be the best way to deal with the theft of intellectual property by China. What yeah. would be a better way, or what, what are some alternatives that might be uh, useful? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. The uh, uh, tariffs could be useful in this situation. Uh, the main deficiency in the Trump approach is to define the trade deficit as the problem. Uh, we have trade surpluses with some countries. We have trade deficits with others. And if we sought to have an absolute perfect balance with every country, it simply, the world system would not work. The problem that concerns me with China is the degree uh, to which they steal intellectual property and with, in the degree to which they make economic cooperation dependent upon that transfer of intellectual property. And then on top of that, there is the security issue uh, of the fact that the transfer of good ideas and technology, whether it's robotics or artificial intelligence or anything else, from the industrial sector to the military sector is seamless in China, and they don't make any secret about it. What's the right way to find it? Well, tariffs might be one way. Another way might be doing things that are contrary to common notions of free trade, but simply saying, uh, we are not going to sell you any more airplanes until we have an agreement on intellectual property, or we're not going to allow the import of pick something that matters to the Chinese. Find a point of leverage. It's a really hard one because unlike our trade relationship with Canada and Mexico, where all three countries have been playing by the rules under NAFTA, 
The fact is the Chinese are not playing by the rules, and to get their attention, maybe we have to break some rules ourselves. That's a difficult thing for me to advocate, but I think it's the right thing to do. And if it's a combination of tariffs or of non-tariff barriers that we put up to trade in, other, in either direction, it could get their attention. Um, that's a partial answer. Yes, sir. In three days, um, President Trump and President Xi are going to meet, I believe, in South America. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you think is the best outcome that could come from that meeting? And uh, what do you think is the actual result? Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess not meeting is not an option. OK. Um, the. Um, Again, I think uh, that they have, uh, the best thing would be if the president articulated to President Xi that our concern is not just about the numbers. It is about the way that you take advantage of the world economic system. You don't play by the rules, but you benefit from everybody else playing by the rules. Giving some very specific examples and then giving a very specific threat and maybe something more important than just tariffs. Uh, President Xi has greater powers within his system than President Trump has within ours to undertake retaliation. Uh, so it's not an easy conversation to have. And the problem is it would require the president to read something that's longer than a page. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, there could be a valuable discussion about uh, kind of assurances that they will, that we are not looking for military confrontation. Uh, because I think that's important, the tone you set at the top, and I think that you know, the kind of tone that President Trump and, some, and President Putin and sometimes President Xi set is one of belligerence uh, and, you know, kind of cocky, we can take on all comers. Uh, and maybe you want to do that when you're running a political campaign. Uh, but when two presidents are talking and two presidents who both know the extraordinary high cost of any U.S.-China military confrontation, it's a good moment to talk about we need not only to tell each other that we are not interested in going to war, we also need to have our military talk to each other more. Uh, we're kind of in a funny situation. I know, uh, and I, I, I know that all of our U.S. military leadership is convinced that we need more of what we call mill-mill dialogue. We need it with the Russians in order to prevent uh, a crash between two ships in the Baltic Sea from turning into a war. We need it with the Chinese in order to prevent a crash between two airplanes in the South China Sea from turning into a war. It's very difficult to engage the Chinese, but it has to be tried. It's difficult from our side to engage the Russians because of the Russian intervention in Ukraine four years ago. Both successive administrations and the Congress have made it really tough for us to have the kind of military dialogue with Russia that prevents that kind of, uh, of serious work on deconfliction. So. Uh, It'd be nice if President Xi and President Trump agreed not to start a dialogue about nuclear weapons, but to say we both think it's important for our two militaries to talk to each other a lot more uh, on, on all levels. That would be the nicest outcome I could think of. What the actual outcome will be, I don't know. Our next question. Yeah. How much, if at all, do you think avenging past humiliation factors into China's relationship with the United States and Russia's relationship with the United States? Putin, in particular, seems to have 
personal animus towards the United States. Yeah. And if he were removed from power, would the next guy in line share that? Uh, yeah. Great questions, and the answers are yes, they're huge. In the case of China, uh, China versus the world, now exemplified by the United States, and Russia against the United States specifically. Um, there's a talk that I've given to, to Chinese diplomats and academics that is not always well received, but I believe it. Uh, and the short version goes like this. The United States and China are always going to have problems with each other because we are so similar. Both of us believe that we are at the very center of God's universe. Both of us believe that everything every other country does is actually directed at us because we're that important. Uh, both of us have written our histories so that there is no mention of aggression, imperialism, military attacks by our country against others. And therefore, neither of us can understand why small countries feel threatened when we create an enormous military force. And really, the only difference between the United States and China in this big scheme of things is capitalism. Capitalism is much more central to Chinese foreign policy than it is to US foreign policy. They do truly have a mercantilist foreign policy uh, that is very much about transactions and what, what will good relations with your country do for my economy. Uh, we are now moving in that direction, but it's really the Chinese who invented it. Um, the, uh, it's fun to talk to the Chinese and to remind them that, look, I was, I'm old enough that I was reading stuff that the Chinese Communist Party was saying in the 70s and 80s when they defined themselves as the world leaders against hegemony the dominance by one nation over its neighbors. You guys don't talk about hegemony anymore. You've decided hegemony is a really good thing, as long as it's Chinese hegemony over your immediate neighbors. Uh, and the Chinese diplomats and government leaders are much less capable than American diplomats and the usual American leaders of recognizing that some countries don't trust them. You know, there's, there's a reason that the United States has 50 formal allies around the world and a lot of friends, uh, and China only has North Korea. It's not that we got the first draft pick, you know, and, uh, and the Russians only got Belarus, uh, too bad. <laughs> Those are countries that made a choice of who they trusted to be an ally. And the Chinese are absolutely incapable of conceiving that. They said, no, it's, you've got all those allies. They've gone with the stronger military power they thought could protect them. It's got nothing to do with values. Uh, but the fact is that the countries in Southeast Asia, and you know, the, again, the most enlightening thing for somebody of my age is to go to Vietnam. And I've had great meetings with Vietnamese leaders. It's really, it's the most dynamic, fascinating country I've been to in the last 10 years. It's an amazing place. Uh, and if you ask them, you know, are, we're good now? We're all past that war? And they say, yeah, hey, we only fought you once. We fought the Chinese 10 times. 10 times they've invited us, and we don't forget it. Uh, the Chinese are distilling their current approach down to we just have to become stronger economically and military, militarily than the United States, and then we will be the new United States, and are really not capable of recognizing that United States leadership came about for reasons other or beyond military and economic power. Uh, and what it, it makes me worry uh, because I have 
uh, because it is almost a religious belief that it is inevitable that China will overtake the U.S. and can then do what it wants. Uh, and people who have that, who believe God has assigned them that kind of power, all right, not God in this case, but heaven, inevitability, uh, are more likely to act rashly. And I think that's what worries me the most about China. In the case of Mr. Putin, it is absolutely uh, a sense that he feels that the West kicked Russia when it was down in the 1990s, uh, and that therefore any means are legitimate to restore Russia's seat at the table. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's very much about the United States. Would a new president be any different? I don't know. I don't know. The, uh, uh, it's a reason I'm concerned about the United States. Uh, there are some historians are doing interesting work now about countries that have made a transition from monarchy or colonialism to democracy and then fall back into a period of authoritarianism, do they ever really get back to true democracy? And there's, I can't remember who wrote it, but an interesting article I saw just lately, I'll go dig it up, uh, says it's really tough. Even if you had a long history as a democracy, if you have tasted neo-fascism for a generation, it's really hard to get back to a democracy. So this is why I watch some of the countries that I've worked in and worked with, like uh, Serbia or Hungary or Poland. Uh, Egypt doesn't, never had a real democracy. Uh, to see, uh, you know, is there a point beyond which you can expect nothing but a succession of authoritarian leaders in the future. That's what worries me. And then you could easily argue that the, you know, 10 or 12 years of uh, a semi-functioning democracy in Russia, that's the exception in a thousand year period and you might wait another thousand years for another exception. I don't want to be that pessimistic. <laughs> Oh, that's because my answers are too long, but I, I have more time if you want us to. I, I just had one question. You were talking about trust. And for those of us, and I won't speak for others, but uh, have more trouble trusting our own government these days um, because of what looks at times to be very irrational and very inconsistent policy among senior members and, and the president, why should Iran or uh, China, or North Korea, or um, Russia, or for that matter, our allies uh, have greater trust in us. And my, my larger question is, can we ever get back to a point um, where, particularly with our allies, where we've, we've uh, rebuilt the trust that we've had and developed over the last 70 years? Yeah. Uh, on the first part, you said it better than I did, that uh, the, um, a president who pulls out of agreements so lightly, uh, as easily as he declares bankruptcy, uh, it's, it, it's one thing in a business context. Uh, if you don't like doing business with somebody who you found unreliable in business, you find someone else. There is no other United States. And for uh, our allies and our adversaries to conclude, either there's no point in signing an agreement, or to conclude the opposite, we can sign whatever we want with this guy. Uh, if he's happy with it, we can redo it in two years or six years or whatever. Uh, that's not the kind of solid basis for U.S. reliability and U.S. leadership in the world that we should be seeking. Uh, but you put it very well. 
the question about whether it's recoverable, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I, I worry about uh, you know, the, the institution I loved very much, uh, the Foreign Service of the State Department, and the way that its leadership has been cleaned out. Uh, but I'm also confident that uh, there are so many good people at the lower ranks of the State Department that you know, if, if, if you lost a whole bunch of generals and a whole bunch of senior diplomats, you'd have some adjustment problem, but there's great people coming up behind them. If there's not a budget for the State Department in the future, uh, if there's a continuation of the White House not believing that the State Department's work is valuable, that's a problem. Uh, but I do believe that a, uh, a different approach from Washington could recreate the sense of trust uh, that much of the world relied on for such a long time. It's going to set us back. There's not going to be anything automatic about it. And simply changing the U.S. president won't immediately make the U.S. commitments on climate change or the Iran nuclear agreement viable again. There'd be a lot of, nor will it mean that we immediately have nothing to worry about on the U.S.-Russian nuclear front. Uh, it will take time, but I do think all of it is recoverable. You sure we don't have more time? Because I am. <laughs> Thanks.